Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining me for our morning day text. Today is Tuesday, July 16th. It's my birthday, actually. 47 years old. Never felt better. I feel faster, younger, stronger, smarter, and more importantly, I feel closer to Ja than I ever have at any point in my life. So I'm glad that you're here with me <laughs> and uh, enjoying this day with our day texts. So we'll get right to it. As you know, we read through the various biblical books and letters so that we can get a better understanding of these texts that were written long ago by various individuals who worship the god Jah and who bore witness and who taught about the things that Jesus did and taught when he was alive. So our primary focus is the god Jah, all those people and nations who worshipped or interacted with him or those who worshipped him, and those whom Jah sent, most importantly, his son. So we're working through the revelation that God gave to his son in our view, who in turn sent his angels, who presented it to people like John, who then communicated all the information to the different Christian groups existing at that time, right around the end of the first century, probably. So we're going to be reading chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. It's a little bit longer reading than normal, but that's because of the way that the text flows. We're going to read the entire message to the Christians gathered in Laodicea. So, let me just verify here. Okay, I think we're good in terms of uh, sound and everything. I did make a change. <laughs> I always get a little paranoid over the sound because I change it frequently for different shows. And even though I did do a check, I don't know why. It's just uh, several times I've either forgotten to change it and got gotten going, and so it sort of stays with me. Did I change the sound? Anyway, it looks like it's okay. So we're going to get right to the reading here in Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. And then once we're done with the reading, I'm going to go through a section of one of my books with you on Revelation 3, 14. Not a lengthy section, but we're going to cover some information pertaining to a description given to Jesus in verse 14. So let's go ahead and start with the reading, cover the material, and then we'll come back to that text. So this is what's being written or conveyed to the Christians gathered in Laodicea. We've read messages to the Ephesian Christians, to the Smyrnan Christians, to the Theoretarian Christians, to the Philadelphian Christians. So we're getting these different messages to the different groups that had come into being at that time after due to the missionary work of the Christians with the help of the Holy Spirit in our view. The thing that gave them special power and allowed them to do things they otherwise couldn't do. Verse 14, to the messenger. Now, it, I should point out, the reading is in the description below. You can read along with any translation you'd like. This is my own translation. So the day texts are based on the translations I've done to date. I haven't translated every biblical text. So at times we use other, other translations. But in the day texts, I try to just stay with what I've done because I know it best. And I can talk about it critically if I need to. Verse 14, to the messenger of the Christians gathered in Laodicea, you must write, the Amen, the faithful and honest witness, the beginning of God's creation says these things. Verse 15, I have come to know your works. He said this to all of them. He is watching all Christians, and rightly so, because we're called by his name. I have come to know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. As with food, I had hoped you would either be something cold or hot. Verse 16, keeping with this, because you are warm and neither hot nor cold, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. 
Now, other translations like the NWT will say, vomit you out of my mouth. And I have a note that's in the description, but that we're not going to read today, that goes into that, the translation of spit you out versus vomit. Vomit is just too strong for what's being described here as basically tasting food. And the taste is inadequate to the point to where Jesus figuratively spits the food out of his mouth. The food, in this case, representing the zeal and spiritual attitude of the Christians. They're not doing anything. They're not hot. They're not cold. They're just warm. And the food, in this case, is better hot or cold, like many foods are. So, verse 17, for example, you say, I am more than satisfied. I've become wealthy. I have no need at all. But you have not learned. You are the one who's miserable. People feel sorry for you. You are poor, blind, and without any clothes, completely exposed or naked. Why would he say this? Verse 18, I'm warning you to become wealthy. You need to obtain gold from me that has been purified by fire. And you need to obtain clean clothes from me so you may get dressed. Then the disgrace from your lack of clothes may not become openly exposed. You should also get from me a healing ointment to rub into your eyes so you can see what's happening. Verse 19, I reprove and I discipline as many people as I love. He's trying to save us. Therefore, you must be eager and you must change your attitude. Right? Don't we often hear about parents and children and how parents are often saying to their kids, I'm just trying to protect you. I love you. I'm trying to save you from all this terrible stuff. And the kids, including myself at times in the past, we often look at the parent and we think, just let me do what I want. Right? If the parent's sitting here trying to help us avoid devastation often. But we often think we know better than the parent who's learned, lived longer than us and learned what we have yet to learn. And that's what he's talking about here. He's talking about people who don't think they need anything in terms of, of, the, of the spiritual benefits that Jesus provides. In other words, they're just satisfied doing what they want to do. And they believe that their satisfaction is sufficient. They don't need anything of value like gold. They don't need any new clothes. And they don't need anything to help them see better. It's kind of like the Pharisees. Remember when they said to Jesus, and he, he was dealing with people who were blind, and, he, and then the Pharisees said, we're not blind also, are we? And, he, and then Jesus said, well, you say you see, so your sin remains. So they were not, they didn't view themselves as in need of anything, even though Jesus was right there to give them everything because they didn't have anything, right? They had all the accoutrements, the outward appearance, the clothes, right? They had the scroll containing cases, the long robes with the fringes. That's not the kind of clothes he's talking about. He's not talking about the kind of gold that would give them the confidence in a material way. And he's not talking about a natural healing ointment so that they can just see better in their satisfaction without any need for him. They need the real clothes. They need the real gold. They need the real healing ointment that comes from Jesus. Let's see what he says next to them. Verse 20, look, I have stood close to your door and I am knocking. Remember in the last message to the Philadelphians, I believe it was, he said, I have opened a door for you that no one can close. Here he says, I have stood close to your door and I'm knocking, right? The door's not open for these people. The door was open for the Philadelphians or the I believe it was the Philadelphians where we read that 
he had opened a door that no one could close. Now they just needed to walk through it. Here, the Laodiceans, there's something different going on. They're in a state of mind where they don't perceive any need, either for clothes, for valuable things, or for healing ointments. They need all three. That's why he's standing by the door knocking. They have to open that door. If ever someone should hear my voice and should open the door, I will come in with him and I will eat with him and he will eat with me. Who opens the door? The Laodicean Christians are the ones who open the door. Jesus is standing at the door knocking. We have to open the door. Or if we're in the Philadelphian Christian category, we have to walk through it. it we've got to respond, my friends. And we've got to we've got to act. We don't have to earn anything because we can't. That doesn't mean we don't act. That doesn't mean we don't show we believe. Why wouldn't we do that? Verse 21. To the one who comes away victorious, not to the one who just believes and doesn't do anything to demonstrate that belief. To the one who comes away victorious, I will grant permission to sit with me on my throne. Even as I came away victorious, and I sat down with my father on his throne. That's why Hebrews 1.8 and Psalm 45 says, God is your throne. It actually more literal than the Hebrew, I believe, and you can check in my, my writings on this. It says, God has enthroned you. But um, it's translated a little bit differently in the Septuagint and in Hebrews 1.8. But the, the point is it is still consistent with the basic idea that the throne... The throne Jesus possesses is from the Father. He was given access to that throne after coming away victorious. Exactly like Philippians 2 says. He was existing in the form of a God, just like John 1, 1 says. Took on the form of a man. Once he realized he was in the form of a man, he did something about it. Lived and died faithfully to Jah. As a result, he was raised and given the name, given the name, above every name. He sat down with his father after becoming victorious. That's what we have to do. It's not as hard as it seems. We all have to die anyway. So why not give our life and service to John Jesus? They're the ones whom in our belief gave it to us in the first place and can give it to us again. That's why verse 22, the one possessing an ear must listen to what the Spirit says to the gathered Christians. So I think most of that is pretty straightforward and clear. And I think most of the Bible, even Revelation, is straightforward and clear, other than a few sections that require understanding of other texts and histories and nations and different things like that. But more often than not, these texts are clear. Sometimes he speaks figuratively, of course, for things like gold, clothes, healing ointments, but that's not hard to understand. It's not like it's so difficult for us to realize that there are people here who are in a condition that's not what they think it is, right? They're fooling themselves. It's, it, they're, they're in a state of mind where they don't think they need to do anything. Yet, how could that be? How could we not need to do anything and, yet, and still be responsive to the message or the law in our heart, the thing that tells us what's right and wrong, how could we not be responsive to that on some level unless we were just very vain and self-content in ways that don't reflect love for other people? That doesn't mean we all have to be active to the same degree and we all have to produce the same amount. That's not even what the Bible teaches. It teaches that different people produce different amounts and that as long as you produce anything, and you don't just deposit it in the banks because you were, you're afraid of the master, like Jesus' illustration. Well, they, that in that illustration, they didn't deposit it even in a bank to gain interest, right? Which would have been something. The point of Jesus' illustration of the person that did nothing is that they did nothing. 
That's exactly what he's talking about here. They're warm. They think they have everything. They don't do anything as a result. And that's what Jesus said in his illustration about the people to whom he gave the talents. The ones that did something with it were given more. Even if you're not going to do anything with it, give it to someone else or even a bank, right? And, and let, it, let the, the money draw interest so that when the master returns, you can say, here, here's your, what you gave me, plus I invested it. Instead of just burying it and doing nothing because you're so afraid of the master and what he gave you, you don't know what to do. Why don't you just do what he told you to do to the extent that you can? Don't compare yourself with other people. People have different circumstances. He's not talking to the Laodiceans in the exact same way he's talking to all these other Christians. He takes a look at them, he examines them, and he gives them a proper assessment. He doesn't compare them. He doesn't say here to the Laodiceans, you know, those Philadelphian Christians are making you guys look really bad. <laughs> well, the Smyrnan Christians... You guys need to raise your, your standards. You know, he's not doing that. He's just addressing them for who they are. He's not trying to create division among his own people. He wants them to come away victorious. To the one who comes away victorious, verse 21, I will grant permission to sit with me on my throne. So we know what the hope is. And what this hope leads to in terms of the earth and all the things in it, ultimately glorifying John. Now, let's take a look back at verse 14. Okay, so here, this is a text Trinitarians have a really tough time with, and Unitarians, because it disproves both of them. It proves Jesus is actually the first creation, the firstborn, just like Paul teaches, just like Hebrews teaches. Jesus repeatedly says he comes from the realms above. We come the, from the realms below. He makes an obvious comparison there in terms of origin. So Unitarians that deny Jesus' prehuman existence have no biblical basis. It's really, really weird, okay? Their interpretation of texts is really um, strange in many cases, whereas Trinitarians just go to an excess, over-glorify the Son in ways they don't need to. But Unitarians take away from his glory, and that's unfortunate. We'll still work with them if they don't contradict what the Bible teaches about Jesus, and his pre-human existence. It's all over the place. But if you contradict us in any way on the pre-human existence, out of here. We don't work with people who deny obvious biblical teachings. That doesn't mean we'll shun you, not work with you in other ways. But we're not here to teach false doctrine. So if you haven't figured out that Jesus pre-existed his human life according to the Bible, you don't have to really believe that if you don't want to. But if you deny the Bible teaches that, we can't help you. And we're not going to be able to assist you because your level of understanding is just too far gone. And you're not able to put together basic statements that Jesus and others make about his pre-human life. And so there's just nothing we can do for you. You're welcome to keep listening. And like I said, help us promote Jesus as the Christ. But we're not going backwards. We're not going to go down a level to a, an inferior belief that's contradicted all over the place by the best available evidence. Trinitarians, again, their worst issue is they over-glorify the Son in ways that I think I can still at least work with if they don't contradict me. They're going to have to answer for that, though, of course, because it's equally clear that Jesus is the beginning of God's creation, the wisdom of Proverbs 8, the one whose origins are from ancient times, Micah 5, and who lives because of the Father. John 5, 26, 6, 57. All the texts, John 1, 18, only begotten God, Hebrews 1, 3, imprint of God's being. We could go on and on and on. We literally would probably run out of ways to show the Bible describes Jesus as having an origin of life, pre-human origin of life. So that's why we just don't tolerate the nonsense of Trinitarians or Unitarians who deny his pre-human existence because it's not an issue in the Bible. It's clear. It's everywhere and in multiple texts. So when people deny that, we know, okay, next. <laughs> Don't waste your time with people who are going to tie you up in arguments about some of the most basic statements of our faith. Now let's take a look at verse 14 in a little closer detail. 
beginning of God's creation. So you have some Bibles that mistranslate this origin or ruler of God's creation. Trinitarians basically collapse when they come to this text, the hardened apologetic whack jobs. Normal Trinitarian people who are just trying to worship God in Christ, they don't they don't really care about this stuff too much. I mean, they'd care about how we translate verse 14, but I'm talking about the ones who repeatedly seek out people like you and me to argue over how these texts should be translated. So, let's take a look at uh, a section from my, one of my writings that talks about Revelation 3.14. Let's just do this real briefly. So this is my third edition. You can get a copy in either hard cover or digital format. You can get this section on Revelation 3.14 for free. It's on my topical index under B, Bible, Bible Texts, Revelation 3.14. Let's take a look at the section. Okay, so according to the Revised Standard Version, Jesus is called in Revelation 3.14 the beginning of God's creation. NWT, beginning of the creation by God. The Greek is he arche teis keteseos tu theu. The beginning of the creation by God or of God. God is the one creating here, not Jesus. He's never shown as the one creating. Even Colossians 1, 16, 17, the verb for create is passive, showing that someone else is creating through him, the one who made him firstborn. So the question is, uh, why do some Bibles mistranslate this and not call Jesus what he's called? That is the beginning of God's creation. Well, it's really simple. They either believe in the Trinity, which requires them to deny these biblical texts, or they believe in Unitarianism, which requires them to do the same. Okay, so Ron Rhodes, in his, one, in his book, um, Reasoning from the Scriptures with Jehovah's Witnesses, he says, in responding to the Watchtower's interpretation of Revelation 3.14, it's critical to note there's a wide range of meanings for the Greek word translated beginning, RK. And that's true. But let's take a little bit closer look at this. Because that's just not a that's not a um, an accurate assessment in total. So while it is true RK can have meaning other than beginning, if we check all the occurrences of RK in the New in the New Testament, when it's followed by a genitive expression of the, like in this case, of the creation, that's what is meant by a genitive, shows that it always denotes a beginning or first part of something. See, Rhodes just highlights the word and doesn't look at it critically in its grammatical context. And even when it's used without a genitive expression of the, it means beginning 32 times. In fact, several times in Revelation, what, what does God call himself? Beginning and end. Note the contrast with beginning and end. It's uh, He's not calling himself the ruler and the end. Beginning and end. Alpha and omega. First, last. Revelation 22, we'll get to it. Totally inconsistent with what Jesus is called here in Revelation 3.14. So it's not true that RK with a genitive means um, anything but beginning. And we're going to go through that in the New Testament. And even on its own, apart from a genitive expression, that is, it means beginning 32 times. Now, the, the 13 times, of the remaining 13 times, I should say, of RK in the New Testament, two times. Okay, so 32 times it's used of a beginning when it's not a part of a genitive expression. The other 13 times that it's not used with a genitive, like in Revelation 3.14, two are used of the four corners of the earth. Corners, there's like a starting point. The final 11 are used to denote governments or rulers, and where such meanings are intended, this is very important. RK in the New Testament is always used with other expressions that denote power, dunamis, or authority, exousia, always. So Rhodes, he just says there's a wide range of meanings for the Greek word, doesn't get into the fact that it always means beginning when part of a genitive, means beginning 32 
of the 45 times it's used apart from a genitive, and the remaining 13, two of them are for the extremities of the earth, the starting points or beginning points of the corners of the earth, however you would look at that, clearly doesn't involve rulership. And the 11 times that it does denote governments or rulers, it's always used with other qualifying terms denoting power and authority, which we don't find in Revelation 3.14, in addition to it being used as part of a genitive expression. So based on the above information, the use of the singular archaic in general and when used with the genitive expression specifically support beginning as the meaning of RK in Revelation 3.14. Now, in spite of these good reasons that I just reviewed, Rose cites the Bauer, Arndt, Gingrich, and Danker lexicon where it says uh, RK can mean first cause. And, Revelation, and it does list Revelation 3.14 under that text. Now, there was some change made in this, uh, however, as it relates to the um, Bauer, Arndt, and Gingrich lexicon. But let's just go with what, it, what, we, what I have cited here. No biblical passages are cited in the Bauer, Arndt, Gingrich, Danker lexicon for, under RK for where they cite Revelation 3.14 as being first cause. None. And they can't do that because I just went through all the uses of RK with you. It always means beginning when it's used with a genitive. And it never has the meaning first cause. Yet that's what they listed under here. You've got to watch some of these lexicons and dictionaries at times because they'll include various Trinitarian ideas or concepts with no biblical evidence. Now, the same lexicon went on, went on to say this, which Rhodes did not mention. The meaning beginning equal first created is linguistically possible. And I would argue it's actually probable, if not required, based on the information we just reviewed. Let's go over a few examples. So I've talked about RK with the genitive, right? Always meaning beginning, like in Revelation 3.14. Here are examples. Matthew 24, 8. Beginning of birth pangs. It's a start of the pangs of birth. Mark 13, 19. Very similar to Revelation 3, 14. It, identical except for the ar use of the article. Arches kiteseos. Beginning of creation. It's exactly like Revelation 3, 14 except for the article. John 2, 11. Beginning of the signs. Philippians 4, 15. Beginning of the good news. Not ruler of the good news. Hebrews 3, 14. This is a little bit different one. The confidence we had at the beginning. I have a note to this here. You can look at the particulars. But also means beginning. Hebrews 5, 12. The beginning of the words of God. We can go on and on. You could look at every single text where you have... Here's another one. Very similar to Revelation 3, 14 and, and the one from Mark. 2 Peter 3, 4. Ap arches kiteseos. From the beginning of creation. Exactly except for the article, like Revelation 3.14. Now, there are plenty of other examples from the Septuagint or Greek Old Testament text translated into Greek, and I give examples in my note down here you can look at. We'll take a look at one, though. Now, the lexicon, the bag lexicon, Bauer, Arndt, Gingrich, Danker, refers to an article by C.F. Burney, uh, an older scholar uh, who wrote a while ago, and I cited this in my chapter in this book on Proverbs 8.22 because Bernie also writes about that. But he, with reference to Revelation 3.14, he believes that's an allusion to Proverbs 8.22, and I believe he's correct, because it even refers to wisdom as in the same way as, as Jesus in Revelation. Here's what it says. So Bernie, first, let's see what he says. Interpreters have not a shadow of authority for limiting and meaning to the source of God's creation, or first cause, like Bag. Bag refers to the article by Bernie. And in stating first cause with no examples is contradicted by Bernie. The very article they cite who says there's not a shadow of authority, which is why they cited no texts for first cause. Now, if we look at uh, Rhodes' view, he believes Revelation 3.14 means Jesus is the beginner <laughs> of God's creation. 
He's, I mean, they, they, they just, the Trinitarians have such a difficult time with these clear biblical texts that they can't accept because of their teaching. They have to totally torture them into a new understanding that is contradicted by every other text that pertains to this issue. In other words, again, it, it doesn't even make sense what he's talking about. God's creation. God's the one who creates through the word. God is the beginner, yet he makes Jesus the beginner of God's creation. How could that be when God's the one doing the creating? He believes this passage harmonizes with Colossians, Hebrews 1, and John 1, 3, all of which teach exactly what we're talking about in Revelation 3, 14. Colossians 1, 15 calls Jesus the firstborn. Deuteronomy 21, 17 couldn't be clear. That means he's the beginning of God's generative power. Just like every other firstborn, means they're the firstborn, beginning of that father's generative power. Jesus is not figuratively the firstborn. He's the firstborn, only begotten son of God. The only one called those terms, no one else. He's not using titles that belong rightly to God's true firstborn. He is God's true firstborn. Hebrews 1, 2 says he's the imprint of God's being and the one through whom God made the ages. John 1, 3 sets up the context with Genesis 1, in the beginning. All things that were made in the beginning were made through the word. That's dealing with the beginning of the physical creation. Colossians 1 goes beyond that and deals with other creations, which were made by God through the firstborn, just like Proverbs teaches. The one who was there with Jah in the beginning. It says that in Proverbs 8. He was putting things together with the Father. Okay, now, of course, 1 Corinthians 8, 6 states clearly that all things are out of the Father and through the Son. Consistent again with Proverbs 8. So now let's talk about one Old Testament text, though, that has come up in, in various discussions. In Job 40, 19. Here, reference is made to the beginning of the Lord's creation. R.K. plasmatos kiryu. Here, a form of the Greek word plasma is used instead of create, keteseos, is used which can involve something or someone formed, such as when Adam was formed from the dust. See, it doesn't use creation. It used form, a form of the word plasma, the way Adam was formed from the dust. In Genesis 2, 7, 8, the LXX in the Septuagint, in fact, uses a form of plasso, which means to form. And in Genesis 2, 7, 8, the Hebrew text uses a word which more, more closely, I should say, corresponds to plasso in terms of forming something. And the Hebrew text uses a word which refers to the beginning of God's ways. In, in, in Job 40, 19, where the Septuagint here says beginning of the formations, the things the Lord formed. The Hebrew text says that, that the behemoth here, this was being described in Job, is the beginning of Jah's ways. And that's significant because in Proverbs 8.22, that's exactly how wisdom is described. But in the pre-earthly time, whereas here, Behemoth is being referred to in the earthly realm as the beginning of the formations of Jah. And let's talk about what is meant there. As for Behemoth, the one called the beginning of the Lord's creation, no one knows exactly what type of creature that is. Some say hippopotamus, but that doesn't fit well with the other descriptions where Behemoth's tail is said to bend down like a cedar tree. Now you get a hippopotamus's tail is not something you would describe like a cedar tree. And then consider the account in Genesis 1 and 2. On the fifth day of creation, we'll talk more about this in our coming day text. Genesis 1, 24 says, Let the earth put forth living souls according to their kinds. Domestic animal. Hebrew, behema. That's the singular form of behemoth. Used in Job 40, 19. 
and moving animal and wild beast and earth according to its kind. I believe what Job 40 is talking about is what Genesis 1, 24 is here describing, even referring to the very same type of creature. So, it would then appear that Behemoth was the beginning of the Lord's creation of the land formations, right? Not creation in, in, in the total, absolute sense, but the formation of animals from the dust of the earth, just like the Bible describes Jah doing on the fifth day. So all of these things are consistent with the use of the term RK in Revelation um, 3.14. One other text we can look at is in Numbers 20, 24.20. Here it uses RK for Amalek as the first of the nations or the beginning of the nations. But Amalek was not the first of the nations, right? Chronologically speaking. However, Amalek was the first nation to fight against Israel after they left Egypt. And the Targums, the Jewish interpretations of these events, the Targums of Onkelos, Neophyte, and Pseudo-Jonathan, really the, the Jerusalem Targum, make this meaning explicit in their translations. The Targums translate the text from Numbers 2420, the first of the nations who waged war. So I know of no example in biblical or in literature contemporary with the Bible where RK means origin or first cause. Yet that is the meaning preferred by Rhodes. It seems to be preferred in one edition of the Bauer and Gingrich Danker lexicon and which Trinitarians highlight in the face of and in contradiction to all the evidence that I just presented. And that wasn't even all of it. That wasn't even all the evidence that could be presented. RK with a genitive never means anything but beginning or start. RK on its own means beginning 32 of the 45 times in, this, in the New Testament that it's used. Only 11 times is it used to denote authority. Uh, governments or, or rulership, and that's always in connection with other terms that convey the same meaning, none of which are used as part of RK, those texts, of a genitive expression like Revelation 3.14. We have almost exact parallels from 2 Peter 2.4, ap arches keteseos, and Mark 13.19, arches keteseos. That's almost identical to he arche tes keteseos. Just the article. That's it. And that's because he's the beginning. It, not just the beginning of this or that. He's the beginning of the creation by God. So I wanted to go over that with you so you all have a little bit more information. You know where to go in my uh, online material and writings to find uh, my discussion of this text, we've gone over the material so you kind of see how I apply it, what my reasoning is, and now you can decide. But there is no reason whatsoever not to be using this text to prove Jesus was created by God as the beginning of God's creation. It proves it. There's no question. And the, the infinitesimal amount of possibility that it can mean ruler. It, it could, it, there's no evidence it means beginner or source or first cause. That's zero. Okay? That, but yet that's what they prefer. But Or some will say ruler. But it never means that in, in the grammatical comparisons. And it only means that when it's used with other terms denoting authority and power apart from its use as a genitive expression consistent with all the other times it's used to denote beginning. You should not hesitate to use this text. Now, their Bibles will read differently because they're mistranslating it to hide what the Bible teaches about Jesus' creation. They don't, obviously the Trinitarians can't have that, right? So they, they change the text. Many of them do. They're lying. They're lying to hide what the teaching is in this text. They're just as guilty as NWT or others that do that. 
And I'm not saying NWT does it a lot, but they accuse NWT of doing it a lot. And <laughs> they do it all the time. They know this text means beginning of God's creation. And, and even if it's remotely possible that it could have the meaning of ruler, <laughs> even though it's really not comparatively, why would they go for the worst possible meaning? That's like, that's like being an evolutionist and going for the worst possible odds in the face of all the evidence that shows the other option, right? So here we have it. We have Trinitarians in the face of all the evidence denying the most likely meaning of this text. In any case, thank you all for joining me this morning. <laughs> I have a good time when we do these day texts and I look forward to continuing our reading through Revelation. We'll continue tomorrow, the rest of this week, work our way through to start with Genesis where we can get into some more of this information about the beginning of God's creation in the physical sense. But never forget Revelation 3.14. That, that is a powerful text together with Colossians 1.15 and Deuteronomy 21.17, John 1.18. John 5, 26, 6, 57, Hebrews 1, 2. All these texts teach the same thing. There's no confusion at all. Only those who have embraced doctrines taught hundreds of years later that are not clearly detailed in these texts don't agree with these facts. So be very careful. This isn't meant to help you get into arguments with Trinitarians and Unitarians who deny the biblical Jesus. Try to help them or just move past them to other people who need this information. So a person who's confused, just show them this text. Show them all the times the beginning is used with the genitive expression. Even read them like we did. Just go right through them. Read those texts that, that I highlighted in this chapter. And just, just show them the use of the term, how it's used with an of of something expression and then let the person decide that's all we can do right so i hope you'll join me tomorrow for another day text we'll keep working our way through the letter of revelation and get to genesis where i know we will also have a lot to talk about